Welcome to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about digital camo. Broadly, the idea behind digital camo would be that you'd start off with an image of the overall environment that you were developing the camouflage for. Then you'd digitize it, and then you'd zoom in on it until the image was pixelated. The advantage with this image that was pixelated was that the colours that were present in the overall image were still present in the digital image, so there was no need to have to manipulate the colourations. Equally, overlay patterns, so for example if you had leaves that were layering on top of each other and creating shadow effects, these would also be present in the pixelated image. You would recreate the broad environment, but you would not be recreating the shapes within the broad environment. So, for instance, if your broad environment picture included actual images of trees interspersed at different intervals between gorse or greenery, then the pixelated image would reflect the same shades of colour. It was a neat way of deriving a camouflage being able to manipulate it so that the uh, environment you work in was optimized, say, for different ranges. So if you wanted to have a camouflage that worked best at 500 to 1000 yards rather than 200 to 500 yards, you would simply have to take a picture of the overall environment, perhaps with a focus, at 500 to 1000 yards, and then balance out and color mix everything visible at that range. That was the idea behind it anyway. Now, for the human eye and the human brain, when you mention digital camo, we tend to boil it down to a pattern that looks a little bit like this. So, in amongst the uh, various shades, you can see the outlines of the different colorations in the pattern are square or rectangular, in nature and the uh, the different shades are interspersed uh, with each other in a seemingly randomized fashion. Here's another example and the same principle is present. So as far as human perception goes when we refer to digital camo really rather than thinking about how the digital camo was developed and all that other explanation we just shortcut it and think about little squares on, uh, on the fabric in different ways. Digital camo found its first mass use when the Canadian military adopted it as its camouflage fatigue uniform. Now the story of digital camo can't really be complete without mentioning Hyperstealth, which was a Canadian company, so I suppose it's not a coincidence that the Canadian forces would be the first to adopt digital camouflage. And this was, this was back around 1996-1997 when the first issue came out. Early CADPAT ran into a different difficulty though. It was very difficult to reproduce with precision these very angular shapes. And most of the printing that was available at the time could only manage blobs sort of round, rounded shapes. To overcome this, the very first CADPAT issue actually had to be printed by an artisanal company in the UK called Standfast and Barracks. Standfast and Barracks' specialism had always been to, pre to reproduce very precise artisan pieces on fabric in small or large quantity. With such a difficult to produce product right from the get-go, the Canadian military was keen to protect its rights over CADPAT. So this is the CADPAT Temperate Woodland TW pattern and also the CADPAT Arid pattern for use in desert environments. And so they placed it under copyright and CADPAT clothing and gear was not permitted to be sold as surplus. The next big win for Hyperstealth was when the US Marine Corps decided that they, it had to also update the camouflage for its uh, forces, and so they asked Hyperstealth to develop a derivative using the Pixel Digital Camo principle specifically for the Marine Corps. And Hyperstealth came up with a pattern which was slightly smaller in overall print than the CADPAT pattern, had a slightly different coloration, 
and they produced the woodland pattern and also a desert pattern. The Marines also patented or copyrighted their pattern under the name Marpat. Digital camos started emerging all over the world at that stage as the technologies for printing became more widespread. Notable examples include the Chinese Marines, Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, civilian interest in digital camo led to the creation of a limited run of slightly modified Marpat by, by the proper clothing company in the US called Jungle Stalker, in which the shape and the size of the pattern was broadly the same, but the colorations were different. But I think the one that everybody knows best is that uh, near decade when the US Army decided to equip its soldiers with universal camo pattern or this digital camouflage. Now the reasoning behind this very non-green camouflage pattern had been that the US military was engaged very much in the Middle East and Central Asia in quasi-urban environments and so to have a pattern that would be able to work in both arid environments together with the greys present in semi-urban environments would be an effective camouflage. I think that's the point at which digital camouflage actually lost much of its reputation. Hyperstealth, to its credit, was trying to steer the US Army towards its own creation, US Forces Camo, uh, with a number four in the title, and the uh, images that they still have available indicate that it probably had a much more advantageous coloration than the universal camo pattern, which I think has become widely derided as one of the mistakes of digital camouflage. It's clear that the colors chosen for the universal camo pattern aren't very universal. And so it was no surprise that some time later, after the US Army had equipped all of their soldiers with universal camo pattern, they decided to move on to something else. Other countries started producing their own. So, for example, the Russians have their EMR Flora, which is a very uh, green, green, khaki and brown pattern. There are patterns in China, uh, in India, all over the world now that have very little to do with hyperstealth and their original um, development. In a sense, now that digital cam camo has proliferated throughout the world and is no longer seen as exclusive in the way it was back in the mid-90s, I think we're thoroughly into the era of post digital camo development now. I would lump in a Pencott Green Zone together with post-digital camo, although much of the Pencott pattern is very much based on the digital camo. There is a lot more rounding of the hard edges. Uh, the pixelation is one effect that is used, but it is also used in conjunction with shading effects, overlaying effects, and also slight changes in pattern. It's the same with uh, later patterns like the phantom leaf, so you can see that the precision printing is present in in this dappling effect here, uh, but it is also overlaid with colors, with broader swooshes, uh, dots, micro dots, and so I think that's probably the direction that camouflage is moving in now. Uh, I think the US Marines are still using Marpat, the Canadians are still using CADPAT, but by and large most of the other militaries in the Western world have moved on towards a sort of blobbier OCP or multicam derived sort of camouflage, much more back to the previous analogue principle. All in all, I would say Digital camouflage certainly drove a revolution in the way patterns were printed onto uh, fabrics and certainly drove a new understanding, I think, of how patterns could be derived, not just from j trying to mimic shapes in nature, but from manipulating colour patterns and the frequency in which the colours appear. And I think the idea that you would develop camouflage patterns to work at different ranges 
also comes uh, very much from the development of digital camouflage. So I think we have a lot to thank digital camouflage for, even if it is no longer fashionable um, item it was back in the mid-90s and early 2000s. So I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you found it interesting, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye!